Welcome back to Politicking. Democrats are locked in a fierce primary battle for the 2020 nomination. But who do the Republicans fear the most in the general election? We'll talk about that with George C., Republican activist and donor. Okay, George, you're from Texas. You're active in Republican politics. Are you active for Trump? I'm not, actually, Larry. I, I, I'm going to vote for the president, but I've been focusing my efforts on the U.S. Senate and Texas politics. I've been active in the Senate all across the country for many years. Why are you not active for Trump? I think my time's better spent on the Senate and in Texas. We, we're having the Democrats trying to come down to Texas and turn us purple or worse, and I think I need to apply my dollars there. The president's not going to be lacking for money. He's going to have plenty of money. As a Republican, are there things about the president that bother you? I do not appreciate everything that he says, but I am appreciating the vast majority of what he does, whether it's lower taxes, lower regulation, the judges he's appointed. So I'm very pleased with what he's done as president. He's almost out Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan, in terms of his policies for conservatives. But think? what he says and does occasionally, it does make you uh, a bit uncomfortable. <laughs> as a Republican, who do you think is the most formidable Democratic candidate? I think Michael Bloomberg by far, but well, I, well, he's come from nowhere. When you have 60 plus billion dollars to spend on your election, you can come from wherever you want to. So he'll beat out Bernie Sanders, do you think? I'm not sure he will, Larry. I think he'd be the most formidable, but I, I think the Democrats are underestimating that if he's the nominee, or, or will all the Bernie people stay home and not even vote? I'm not even sure he's the most formidable candidate to, to beat Trump. He definitely would be the best president for the country, but is he the most certain to win? And I think the Democrats are in a position where it's almost a 72 election for them, but much closer divided in the country, so they might have a better chance this time around. They do want a revolution at the grassroots, and Bloomberg is the polar opposite of a, of a revolution. He's the billionaire that they've all been railing against for, for years now. Is Bernie a phenomenon to you? I think he is. I remember the first time I saw Bernie on national TV in 2015 as a socialist independent senator from Vermont, and I looked at him, and he looked like your crazy, absent-minded professor that you couldn't wait to get his class over with in college. <laughs> and yet he has all this appeal. I think it's pretty amazing that someone who looks like that and is 70, 78 years old, which is eight years older than the oldest person to ever be elected president, is this viable. And he is. Yeah, he's, he's, he's Bernie. He's Bernie. He, has he, that quality. He, he just needs one word. Yeah. It's hard <laughs> to dislike him. Don't it is hard to dislike him. It's easy to dislike his policies if you're a capitalist and, and you're for yeah. democracy. All right, what's your reaction to Bloomberg? Mega million dollars spent, what do you think? I, I like Bloomberg. I, I would be very comfortable with the country and with our economy and for business if he was president. He's pretty radical on social issues and he's pretty radical on the climate change issue, but in terms of being a no-nonsense, build himself up from nothing businessman, he's the real deal. And I think he would make good decisions for the country. Don't you think there is climate change? Oh, I think there's been climate change for thousands of years. How, what percentage is man-made and what percentage is just the earth changing? And nobody really knows the answer to that. Some of it's man-made, but is it 5% or is it 95%? And we just don't know yet. How do you like Bloomberg's record come to, coming under scrutiny? His positions on stop and frisk, economic equity, treatment of women, is that going to hurt him? Well, I read through all his quotes in the book they published for him from his company on, on women and people within his firm. And they're awkward. They're super awkward. And how he's related to women is super awkward. I think stop and frisk statistically clearly made crime a lot less in New York City. And I think the anger at that is in the African American community and the far left socialist leaning community. But I think Trump, most Trump was for it. He was. Lots yeah. of people were for it at the time. Mike, uh, Melvin Bratton and Rudy Giuliani and all those people who cr cracked down on crime in New York, it worked. Do you see Trump winning the states he won four years ago? I think he'll win some of them. Will he win enough to get, a, get it across the goal line? His campaign manager out of San Antonio is a very crafty, savvy guy, and he's going after some states they didn't win last time, whether it's New Hampshire or Minnesota or New Mexico or Arizona, and they all think he's viable there, too. Eric Trump spoke in Dallas last week, and the Trump campaign is hyper-confident right now. And I think it's a little early with Bloomberg surging for them to be cocky about what their chances are. This is still a 50-50 country and a 50-50 no. election. George, do you think the Electoral College should be abolished? I do not. I think it protects the smaller states in our country. If, if we abolished it, California, New York, Florida, and Texas would determine who is president of the United States. And for our citizens in Nebraska, 
and Vermont and Maine and Iowa, they would not have a say anymore. So I, I, don't, I would not like to see that. The founders set that up purposefully. Right now, though, five states determine the election, right? If you win three out of the five. The swing states, that's yeah. exactly right. But swing states change. Iowa was blue for many, many years, and now it's red. West Virginia was blue for many, many years, and now it's red. So things do change. What did you make of the whole impeachment process? Oh, I just thought it was a tragedy for America. It's obvious the president on that phone call, it was not a perfect call, that there were mistakes made, and issues like that should be dealt four or five rungs lower in the U.S. government not at the presidential level for sure, but to go through an impeachment process that's just formalistic and is clearly political and put the country through that, I think it's the reason the president's approval ratings are at all-time highs right now. The same thing happened with President Clinton. Americans don't want to watch that unless you have Nixonian level of, of bad behavior, and we, we didn't in this instance. The um, Attorney General coming under a lot of criticism, in fact, I think over a thousand former Deputy Attorney Generals have asked him to quit. William Barr, what's your read on him? I, I don't know him personally, so this is from a far uh, commentary, but I think he's a, he's a patriotic American and I think he has an impossible job because he's working in a system where his boss could any day tweet something that puts him in a super awkward position. And I do not think he's a hyper-partisan. I think he's very objective and he's a professional and I think he's, he's doing the best he can for the country. Do you think Trump realizes that he's not, Barr is not his attorney? <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. It seems like he doesn't respect the fact that Barr works for the country, not the president. I think the president is going to do whatever he wants to do, and if that causes blow-ups and problems and issues, I don't think he really cares. I think he's making his own decisions unilaterally, and if it makes it hot under the collar for his attorney general, who he would view as someone who should be working for him 24-7, I don't think he really has much of a sympathy for the Attorney General. Barr recently asserted that the President's uh, social media posts make it impossible for me to do my job. You think he was doing that just for color? A lot of people are saying that's just to look good. I disagree. I think he's a very straightforward professional and I think he got to the point where he wanted to say something pub publicly. I think it was extraordinary that he would do that. Usually, usually your cabinet secretaries are in the background and they keep quiet. So for him to say that, he must have been highly agitated. Uh, another thing, on the other hand, Trump claims the U.S. economy is booming, the best ever. On the other hand, his recent budget plan justifies a smaller than expected uh, proposed pay raise for civilian federal employees by citing national emergency. Which is which? Uh, we have a great economy or do we have a national emergency? We're running trillion dollar deficits and I think the president is finally addressing that reality. He said, I'm not going to cut a nickel from entitlements when he first ran for office and now he's proposing cuts in Medicare and Medicaid and salaries, and it's because the economic realities of running trillion dollar budgets are catching up with him and the country. We can't do that forever. One of the troubles with the deficit as an issue is, as my friend says, it doesn't call you on the phone. It doesn't dun you. It doesn't send you a collection letter. It just builds and yeah. builds and builds until it's kind of like the blob. It finally eats you. you might, it might be far away, but before you know it, it's close by and it's going to take you, take you down. And that's who, what we're facing. Who do we owe it to, George? Where's the, where's the money that's a deficit? We want to pay it. Who do we pay? You, you pay all the creditors of the United States who are a very varied lot of people. And right now, there's, there's, there's too many of them out there. And there's, we're not going to be going back to the Clintonian surpluses that George H.W. Bush created with his tax increase. A pox on everybody's houses. This, is, this goes back to the inflationary 70s and the Reagan defense buildup. We've been running deficits forever. What if they call the note? We'll, we'll, we will do a soft default and, and just, uh, just use the deflating of the currency to, to keep keep those creditors at bay and keep going. And we're the, we're the strongest house in a really bad neighborhood, right, Larry? I mean, you look at other countries around the world and yeah. their balance sheets are much worse than ours, China first and foremost. Is there any Democrat you could support? If he was closer to me on social issues and on, on fossil fuels, I could support Bloomberg, but because he's, he's so contrary to me in those two issues and, and oil and gas is the bread and butter of our country for the next at least 15 or 20 years, and that's the Texas lifeblood of our economy. No, I, I, I couldn't support anybody. But you think Bloomberg will have appeal? I hope so. I really do. I think, I think he would be good for the country generally. I think he'd run the economy well, and I think he'd be a good commander in chief. Tell me about Texas, George. Is, is Texas purple? Texas is, is still blood red right now, Larry, but it could go purple in the next 10 to 15 years if Hispanics start voting in larger numbers 
and if they continue to vote overwhelmingly Democratic. With, with Governor Perry, they voted about 70-30 Democratic. With Governor Bush, most people aren't aware of this, in his last term they, vote, they voted 50-50. And Governor Abbott, Greg Abbott, our current governor, wins around 44% of the Hispanic vote. So it's all going to come down to how they vote in the future. Tell me, it's puzzling to me. Houston, Dallas, San Antonio are all Democratic cities. They are. They so become. How, how, where, is the, where are the Democrats if the three biggest cities are, are Democrats? Why aren't the Democrats in the hunt? It's because it's so close in those urban areas, Larry. It's about 53, 47. And if you go out to the suburbs or smaller communities like Amarillo, Lubbock, some of these Texas cities that are in the 200 to 400,000 range, they vote overwhelmingly Republican, 65-35, which gives you about a 10% Republican margin in a normal election right now. But Hispanics are, are the future of Texas, period. They're going to be our largest uh, ethnic, ethnic group at some point, and if, as they start turning out and more forced to vote, who carries the day with them is going to determine what Texas looks like. Thank you, George. Thank you, Larry. Good to see you. Good to be with you.